Okay, so um, just to uh, thank everyone for coming, it looks like we've got, wow, 73 participants right now. I want to thank the Paha Sapa Grotto for being kind enough to let us use their Zoom to run this meeting. It has a capacity for um, a little bit more than a regular Zoom account, so it allows us to have uh, this many people on. I also want to thank the candidates. We've got um, eight of the 10 candidates here. Oh, actually eight of the nine candidates. Is that right? Yes, eight of the nine candidates here. Um, I've just heard that Fernando has dropped out of the race. And unfortunately, Julian Brooke wasn't able to, able to meet it, make it tonight. He had a, a meeting elsewhere. Um, I want to thank uh, my co-hosts. What are you, have you already started? What, are, what? I'm, I'm going to start arguing already. <laughs> I just wanted a point of clarification. You said Fernando dropped out of the race. Did he drop out of the debate or he's dropped out of the... Keep up, Derek. He dropped out of the race. That's okay. okay. That's okay. I'm just learning. I'm just learning. <laughs> we just had this discussion among ourselves. You must have been off doing something else. But thank you. Thank you for ruining my very well rehearsed introduction for everybody. Thank you. you just... So the next thing I was going to do was introduce Derek Bristol, but he is the co-moderator co tonight, but he's already introduced himself. I was going to say something nice about you, um, but I'm not now. Um, and then the other person who is a co-host is Cindy Wu. And Cindy is going to kind of be managing uh, everything in the background. With this many people uh, on the conference call, it's kind of hard for us to moderate the questions and turn off people that, you know, have like taken their computer into the bathroom with them and are flushing while people are trying to speak. So thanks, Cindy, for, for running around and doing that. Um, so this is unusual. It's something that we've never done before, but we're in unusual times. And I know it's difficult for a lot of, a lot of us, our, our whole, um, world's been turned upside down, but it's actually allowed us to do some things that we never would have done. So the idea of having an online debate is something that perhaps we would not have thought about last year. Um, and this year, you know, everybody's become quite adept at at Zoom and conferencing. So it gives us an opportunity to do something fun like this. Uh, just to remind everybody that, you know, the people who are running are taking this seriously. We're gonna try, as you can already tell, try and keep it a little bit lighthearted because this is supposed to be fun and uh, a fun way to spend an evening and not tedious. Um, but just remember that the, the people who are running are doing it because they care. And um, we're all here, we care about caves and caving. So it's not appropriate to be, to be rude um, to, to the candidates. Um, and just remember that a lot of these candidates, the first time they've run a lot of them for, for any kind of um, office. So I think we should thank all of them for being willing to do that. So the candidates we have with us today are Nick Anderson, John Brooks, Riley Drake, Kim Fleischman, I should have written this bigger, Mark Hodge, Pete Johnson, Sonia Meyer, Ben Tobin. So um, we have the structure of tonight is that we have three prepared questions that we're going to have each of the candidates answer. So these were the three questions that they were given in advance this evening. Uh, and then we have a set of questions that were solicited from Facebook. So the candidate Candidates have not seen those unless they spent some time on the NSS uh, Facebook page. Uh, there's also a, a Slack room where questions were generated. So we're going to ask the prepared questions and give every candidate the chance to answer. Then we're going to have a Facebook question and we're going to randomly pick four people to answer that question. If you have follow up questions, put them in the chat window. And then Cindy is going to curate those and send them to Derek and I so that we can ask a follow on question of the other four candidates. So rather than have everybody, all eight people answer the same question, we're going to have four answer one question. And then based on the follow up questions we see in the chat window, uh, a follow on question to the other four candidates. So everybody will get a chance to speak 
The questions are going to either be 30 seconds or one minute answers, depending on uh, how Derek and I feel. And every candidate will have uh, two minutes at the end to sum up. So if you're a candidate, make sure you're, you're making, making some notes. Um, so everybody is muted. Uh, apart from the candidates. Uh, candidates, uh, just out of respect for the other person talking, maybe you could mute yourself when it's not your your turn to speak. And uh, I think that's it. Anything, Derek? Uh, no, I just, I guess I'd like to add a couple things. I, I, um, yeah, I, I just want to thank the candidates for being here tonight and, uh, and appreciate every one of them for running for office and I just want to echo maybe what Hazel said about it's a huge commitment and time and um, and other resources to be on the Board of Governors. And I think a lot of people don't maybe understand or appreciate what goes into it and uh, um, I appreciate everybody that is willing to step up and serve the rest of the caving community um, and, and so thank you all for being willing to run. Thanks Derek. Cindy, did you want to add anything? I'm good. Okay, thanks. All right, Derek, you're, you're batter up. You're first up. Are we choosing a first person to answer? Or? Uh, everybody gets to answer the first question. Okay, the first question is, when was your first caving trip? And what was it about caves and caving that made you, that you found so appealing? So you have 30 seconds. Let's start with Nick. With Nick. First in the fire. Uh, my first giving trip was a couple years ago when I moved uh, to South Dakota. Um, I didn't know anybody in the local grotto and I joined the grotto and signed up to go dig on a dig project they were working on and I had no idea what I was getting myself into and um, being the type of person that I was uh, I probably embarrassed myself a little bit on that trip and uh, I go back and the members who were on that trip were very helpful and inviting. Um, they could have been you know, making fun of me, tearing me down, but instead they're offering me hints, advice, you know, calling me, asking am I coming back. Um, and it was kind of the caving community here in the Black Hills that really uh, sparked my interest uh, to continue caving after my first couple uh, dig trips and to get more involved in uh, the exploration side and survey and project side of caving. Time. Thank Thanks, you. Nick. John? Mm, audio is not working for John. Yeah, did someone turn John off? Looks like it is. You there, John? Yes, I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah. Uh, my first caving trip was when I started right, college you. in 1976, and uh, it was to Gorman Cave. It was a absolutely miserable, muddy cave with bad air and lots of bats. And um, it wasn't a particularly positive experience. Um, but they told me, if you go on the next trip, which was to the Guadalupe Mountains, you'll enjoy it a lot more. And so the next trip was a two-week trip to the Guadalupe Mountains, and we visited all the, the great caves and the guads, and I was hooked after that. So it took more than one trip for me to get hooked and uh, keep going. But uh, it's been a passion since then, and uh, I, I don't cave as much as I used to, but uh, but I still enjoy hearing about it. And, Still enjoy going whenever I can. Time. Okay, Riley. The participants can't unmute themselves, so I'm gonna unmute Riley. Thanks, Cindy. Um, okay. Um, I think, uh, trip with a caving group uh, was in Hanacroix. It was winter. It was really muddy and very cold. Um, and we spent a ton of time like crashing through ice. Um, but when I got home and warmed up, I read more about caves online and realized that they were incompletely understood environments. And that sort of hooked me. I was like, wow, that was magical to be underground. And also we still don't totally understand all of it. Um, that, that's what got me. Thank you, Riley. All right, some mute Kim here. Okay. 
Okay, Kip, you're up. Okay. Um, I started caving in 1982. My aunt, my uncle was a uh, caver, and he invited me to go to Old Timers Reunion, OTR, in West Virginia. So uh, I got, I went on my first cave trip from OTR, Bowden Cave, and I loved the Keyhole Passage. That's what really sucked me in. Walking in water, which was something I liked to do outside, stream walks. Um, and now underground, it was just really, really, really cool. Um, I still like walking in water caves now. Um, primarily my caving is uh, recreational caving. I'm not a project caver. Um, I don't go as often as I would like, especially now. I think the last time I was underground was November, taking uh, some scout skating, which is how I get out get out uh, several times a year is taking scouts. But I also go to caving events, um, all the regional events and um, grotto events. Thanks, Kim. Uh, so just a, a point of clarification for the candidates. Um, we've got it. So everybody is locked on uh, unmuting themselves. So I'm gonna, we're gonna unmute each of you. Don't mute, mute yourselves because then we have to go in and do it again. So just leave yourselves unmuted and try not to break wind or anything while somebody else is talking, unless it's a political ploy. Okay, uh, same question to uh, Mark. Yeah, so I started caving in early 2011. I had uh, retired from the Air Force after 30 years and I was not a caver. And a friend of mine, or became a friend, uh, a neighbor came by and offered me a tour of the cave on his property. So I said, okay, I'll try anything once. It turned out to be Helictite Cave, which is absolutely stunning the first five minutes. And after I'd been in there a couple hours with the owner, I said, how many miles have we gone? And he said, 800 feet. <laughs> and uh, I said, boy, I, to myself, uh, I think I got some work to do in this department. So I've been going at it really hard ever since. Thank you. Uh, Pete. So the, I was a little bit late to cave in, I think 23, 22, and it was also Hamilton as well, which is a NSS preserve. Um, Bob Hoke took me, it was a great trip, but I also like one definitive memory of mine growing up too is reading the old Nat Geo articles about cave exploration in Mexico and seeing the sketch in the map in Nat Geo where the bottom of the cave just ended and nobody knew it was down there. And having this kind of youthful epiphany to be like, what, what the hell? We, we don't know what's down there. Um, so I think in some ways that was probably as formative as the first time I went. Thanks. Um, Sonia. So I started caving with the Oxford University Caving Club when I was studying abroad in England in college. And my first caving trip was to Swildens Hole. And I went through a 10 foot sump. And I still remember the moment where I completely submerged my body in ice cold water. I'll never forget it. Um, and that's kind of what drew me in was the thrill and the excitement of caving. Um, but when I came back to the US, I got involved with the community of caving in Virginia and now California and um, expedition caving mapping as well as doing cave science. So I kind of just love everything about caving. Thank you. And last, uh, Ben. Uh, so I guess mine is kind of a, uh... A two-part story. It started off kind of by accident in college. I was looking for something to do in the summer and um, got an internship at Blanchard Springs Caverns and got drawn in by the just kind of the the question of what was around the next corner and kind of that ever-present you know what is in there thing um, and I was drawn by the caves. The following summer I got lucky enough to work at um, Wind Cave National Park right at the time that Wind Cave was about to pass 100 miles in length. And so seeing the dedication and the camaraderie and just the drive of the caving community um, blew me away. And then kind of understanding that this was a, an area that you could spend a lifetime actually exploring um, studying and really just trying to understand what's next. That's kind of what really drew me into caves and caving. 
Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so I've got the second question. So this is the second um, question that the candidates got in advance. This is a one minute answer and we're gonna hold you very tightly to time on this one. So to each of the candidates, what do you think is the greatest issue addressing caving in the US at this time? And how do you aim to address it as a member of the NSS Board of Governors? And we're gonna start with um, I'm going to pull up my little bit of paper. You're going to start with Ben. Excellent. Okay, so um, the NSS's vision, right, if you go into our um, documentation, it actually talks about how it views itself as an organization that is the leading force for responsible caving, discovery, scientific study, exploration, stewardship, education, and caving enjoyment. So basically all of the good parts about caving. Um, and honestly, this is what drew me to the NSS to begin with, right? It was this, these goals matched with things that I felt as well, but as I've gotten more into the fields of cave management and cave science, it seems like from that non-caver perspective, the voice of the NSS can get lost. Um, and there's a number of issues that are um, causing this. And I think one is kind of some of our faltering membership um, challenges. And the other is messaging. Um, how do we present ourselves as the voice of caving and uh, time. caves in the time. US. Time. Thanks, Ben. I have my next piece of paper. And the next person is John. Did someone, did Leonardo. someone silence John again? Well, <laughs> just trying to stop silencing John. Where did okay, you, you hear me now? Yes, yeah. thank you. I'm sorry about okay, that. Sure. Gave you a few more seconds to prepare. <laughs> I, I think the, I had a great speech already. I was already underway. Uh, I think the greatest issue facing the NSS is a declining membership. Uh, and I think that goes back to um, who we are as a community and what our values are and how we're, how we're engaging members in the organization. Um, so what I would propose to do is I would propose to create a, a and, and this is a this is a community engagement type thing. So you'd have to you'd have to engage the leadership of the organization in creating it. But I propose that the NSS host a series of town halls halls around the nation to talk to people about what's important to them from the NSS and create a vision that uh, is supported by the community that people buy into and. Uh, as part of those town halls, I would suggest that you engage a full a range of membership, people who are interested in caves and landowners, uh, so that you have a full community buy-in to the process. Uh, aside from that, I think the biggest issue is access to- Time. Time. Thank you, John. Interesting Appreciate idea, John. It. Thanks, John. Have you figured out your randomization process yet, Bristol? My randomization process? You have to randomize. Remember, you had instructions at the beginning. You have the slips. I don't... What, do really? Do you want me to come over to your house and write names on a bit of paper for you? Good <laughs> Lord. All right. Next up is Mark. So I want to pick up on what John was uh, starting to talk about there. Access to caves is my number one issue. And there's two broad classes of denial of access is... The one is uh, private owners uh, that don't like cavers on their property. And the way you do that is engage with the owners. We all know how to do this. The other uh, broad class is stuff owned by the federal and state governments. And right when I started caving, it was WNS, and now it's COVID-19. And that's where a national organization can get, uh, get involved and uh, engage with the state and federal officials to convince them that we're not the cause of the spread of stuff. And that's it right there. If we lose the cave access, we don't, we don't have an organization. Thanks, Mark. You caught me on the back foot there. I had a bunch of strawberries in my face. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next up, Sonia.
Did someone mute Sonia? Is it my turn? It's Sorry. your turn, Sonia. <laughs> uh oh, my internet cut out for a second. Okay. So I'm glad I didn't go first because uh, everyone brought up amazing points. And I kind of actually want to divert this a little bit. I agree with what everyone is saying, but I think that the top issues. Are you trying to say something to me? No? Okay. Go for it. Just plow through, Sonia. I'll give you two more. I'll give you 10 more seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the NSS internals are what we need to focus on before we can, as an organization, focus on these broader issues. So I want to focus on finances, um, the internal functioning of the BOG, um, just getting everything streamlined using technology, revamping the website, communicating with members, uh, like John mentioned. So I want to focus internally first and kind of get things in order before then going back to the NSS mission. Thank you. Next up is Nick. So you know, I think the question kind of addresses what do we think the issue uh, addressed in caving the United States is at the time. And you know, it, it can tie into the NSS, but I think uh, keeping the United States right now lacks a unified voice. Um, you know, when I got into caving, I didn't know what the NSS was. Uh, you can ask anyone who lives in the hills, um, including people who live over karst, and they don't know what the NSS is. And I think the lack of, uh, like I mentioned, a unified voice for cavers in the country right now is lacking. And that's a huge problem in the United States. You know, in the past, the NSS has worked on creating federal laws to protect caves. And now, um, you know, I don't know what contacts we have with the federal government, state governments, uh, to publicly promote uh, cave science, cave education, um, and cave exploration and cave conservation. And we need to kind of get back to those roots and address those concerns. Fantastic, Nick. Thank you very much. Pete. <laughs> Um, I'm actually going to start by saying that I think, you know, a lot of times we focus on the negatives, but I actually think as a volunteer organization, the NSS does a lot of amazing things. Um, that being said, I, I kind of will double down on the resources issue. I think declining finance, financial health and also membership is the biggest issue. Um, I think it seems like a small thing, but I think the number one thing we can do to fix that is to update the website. There's over a million sessions a year on caves.org and there's over a hundred thousand, um, caving related searches every month on Google. Uh, by far, we can touch degrees of magnitude more people through the website and through that public entity than, than anything else we do. So no matter what we think the message should be, uh, we need to update that, that platform in order for young people, especially younger people, to take us seriously. Thanks, Pete. Riley. Oh. More than YouTube? Don't. don't. No. <laughs> not about you, Bristol. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Riley. She's muted. Someone help her. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I think the greatest issue in caving today, as many have said, is the declining um, population of cavers and uh, specifically members of the NSS. Um, and I think that this not only threatens the sport uh, existing, but also threatens the caves themselves. Um, without adequate membership, we can't conserve caves uh, for future generations to use. Thank you, Riley. Great. Kim? So um, I think the main thing um, specific to the NSS is funding. And right now we don't have a fundraising chair. Um, that would, if we could get the uh, fundraising chair filled, then we could have a fundraising campaign to take care of the, the things that need to be done at the headquarters, for example, and other activities. Um, one of the big things is the website. When I was on the BOG a couple of years ago, there was a big push for the bit for a change and an overhaul of the website, and it was going, and then it just stopped. And I completely understand that it's all volunteer, but even creating a website doesn't come for free, so the money's got to come from somewhere. Thanks, Kim. 
All right. So, um, Derek, are you prepared? Do you have yeah. your Do you have your randomization strategy? Am I prepared to ask question number three? Yeah. Do you have your randomization strategy in place? Uh, for selecting who gets to answer? Yes. Um, you had I, you had you I'm had two jobs. I'm, that pulling was, of, I'm pulling a name out of somewhere. Okay, just to let you know that um, people are keeping score, and I am winning so far. Just, <laughs> just so you know. Okay, Derek, go. Wait, is it accomplished? Um, so the qu third question: What are your thoughts on diversity in the in the NSS? And we will start with Sonia. So diversity is an issue that's really important to me as a female minority caver I've often been the only woman or the only minority in a team um, and everyone's super welcoming but it's still something that you notice um, so for that reason my along with my grotto started a scholarship to increase diversity on expeditions um, but in terms of what the NSS should do I think it's a matter of communicating strategies nationally so I would like to analyze what successful grottos are doing. And I mean, um, grottos that have growing diverse memberships and figure out what their best practices are and then communicate that to the IOs so that they can enact those same strategies and that will increase our membership and help address our financial concerns. And also just enable us to do you know, what we wanna do, which is help cavers and caving in the US. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, next, I think we'll uh, ask the same question of Kim. Okay, when I read this question, my first thought was diversity in what? So male, uh, gender diversity, um, racial diversity, um, money, poverty, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I really think it all comes down to the people at the grotto levels because they have to figure out how that works in their particular area. Um, I I'm in the Baltimore Grotto. In theory, you know, we should have more African Americans, but it's just not something that we have going into the city to promote caving um, with the kids there, and that's really where it starts. Um, so my thought on that is that, that it really comes down to the grotto level. Thank you, Kim. Um, Mark. So yeah, I can't I can't speak to the NSS membership issue because I don't know what the you know the makeup of the NSS is, but I can speak because I, I lead a lot of groups that come here from various places, five local universities, various grottos. I see a tremendous diversity in people coming out, with one notable exception. I don't. I've caved with thousands of people in the last nine years, and I've only had two African Americans on my teams. And I don't know why that is. I really don't, because I see a lot of Asians, I see a lot of Hispanics, a lot of women. And I went through this in the Air Force when it was a big deal to have a woman flying a plane for a while. And uh, by the time I left, there were so many female air crew members. It, you know, it was it was a good deal. And I. I see more diversity here, diversity in this organization than I've seen in many other places in life. So I don't think we're doing too badly. I just don't get why African Americans aren't interested in caving at all. I, and I've got 700 Facebook friends and are almost all cavers and not one of them is an African American. Okay, thanks Mark. Uh, ben Tobin. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I actually agree very much with what Kim was saying before that grottos are a very key part to this. Um, it's the local cavers that are talking to the communities about caves and, uh, and getting people in the, those communities to go underground. But I think the NSS has a responsibility as a national organization to kind of set a standard. And uh, yeah. one part of that, I think, is creating a um, inclusion statement for the organization. I think that's a critical piece to lay down what the expectations are. And um, 
beyond that, I think it's good for us as individuals to talk about implicit bias, because I think people of minority groups do see that when we don't necessarily see that implicit bias. So I think that's a discussion that needs to be had at a broader level to figure out how do we address that as a, as a group. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Riley, your thoughts on diversity in the NSS? Let's unmute you. There you go. No, that didn't work. Okay, there you go. I, I got it, I got it, Derek. Don't, you just, you just do I your thing. Like three, I kicked, clicked it three It's okay. Times. It's all right. I just, I'm scoring more points. Go for it, Riley. All right. Um, I believe that the NSS as a national organization has a responsibility to make sure that the grotto environments are inclusive, welcoming, and safe for everyone. And I believe that this shouldn't be done passively by saying, well, if they came to us, we would, we would do something. Um, but rather by recognizing the barriers that exist for involvement for various groups um, and then working to mediate those uh, barriers. So in the MIT Caving Club, uh, students don't have cars and they don't have money, so we subsidize car rentals. Um, in the Boston Grotto, uh, we welcome new cavers by having a gear catch of, of gear that can be borrowed um, before a person uh, that may be unwilling to make a gear investment um, makes that investment. Um, and we also have, an, uh, at the MIT Caving Club, we have a number of social chairs that reach out to new members and make sure that they feel not only as if they are a participant, um, but also actively welcomed in the community. Okay, thank you, Riley. Uh, Nick, your thoughts on diversity in the NSS? I think uh, every organization should strive to represent uh, as diverse of a population as possible. Um, now, with that being said, I think the NSS and the local grottos uh, want the best possible people in their organization, whether they're incredibly good at caving, incredibly good at public speaking, incredibly good at um, science. And it doesn't matter their backgrounds. Um, we want to involve anybody that supports the mission. And if uh, the NSS or a local grotto isn't including people who can support a mission based on their gender or their race, that is a serious issue that needs to get addressed. And I hope that those issues will get back to the NSS if they're existing and that we can uh, address those issues within those grottos specifically and ask why is this occurring within your grotto? Thanks, Nick. Uh, John Brooks, your thoughts on diversity? Am I muted or am I ready to go? Ready to go. Uh, well, I think this is a very relevant and timely issue. Um, I, in my other life in uh, the real estate industry, I, I chair a committee um, of real estate professionals, and we were just talking about this today, uh, and I was making a push to create a diversity and inclusion uh, chair within our committee to help um, raise participation amongst minorities and women in the committee, and our committee is mostly old white guys like me, and a lot of them didn't see the need for it. But I think it's really important for us to uh, for us to put those positions into place. And I would even translate that to the NSS that I think the NSS should create a structured position within the organization or possibly a section to promote diversity and inclusion in the organization. And it could be a group that sets up seminars at the NSS convention. It could be a group that does webinars. Um, but I think there has to be a structure in place to help creating a safe environment for um, others, other people to get involved in caving and make, make them feel comfortable uh, in the process. Okay, thanks, John. Pete, your thoughts on diversity? Yeah, so I think um, diversity is important because I think, you know, all sorts of diversity is important because that leads to diversity of perspective. It leads to diversity of thought and solutions. And um, as an organization, if you're not promoting those things, then you're, you're gonna stagnate. Um, and I think that the thing that's important to remember for people that maybe don't understand the diversity question is that when those, when those people come into grottos or they come into the organization and they, they decide it's not for them for whatever reason, we don't get feedback. They just don't show up again. And, and, and so it's not because they're looking for special attention or they're, you know, complaining. They, they just are going to go spend their time doing something that they would prefer to do. 
And if we want to continue to grow as an organization, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, if we value a national caving organization, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen, you know, and because I believe that a national caving organization, the value is not just for one small subset of people. Okay, thanks, Pete. So what's next? Uh, <laughs> okay, so just um, a clarification for all the candidates. I've made you all co-hosts on the on the debate, so you can now unmute yourself at will. Um, the only person who can't do that is Mark, and we'll we'll make sure not to let that happen to you, Mark. Um, so you guys should be able to turn on and turn off your uh, your your sound now without us having to to run around whack a mole and try and get you online. So what's going to happen now is we're going to go into the questions that were solicited on Facebook. So we're going to ask uh, randomly half the candidates to answer a question from Facebook. And then during that question, um, anyone who has a follow-up question can type that into the chat box. And then we will ask that question of the remaining four candidates. So these are going to be questions with follow-up questions from the audience. So I am going to start and then Derek is going to do the follow-up question. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Are you going to track who's being asked? Yes, you, I'll track. Do you have the spreadsheet you were sent? I have a piece of paper. Let's see what I can That's do. fantastic, Derek. All right. So the first question. This goes to Pete. This question comes from Andy Armstrong. What will the NSS do to help recreational cavers feel welcome and valued in the organization as they once were? I, I would, I'd actually, I saw that question from Andy and I'd be interested to hear more about what specifically he, he feels about that. But I, I think a big part of that is probably regional events. Um, I think a big part of that is grotto culture, uh, connecting people so that there's more recreational trips. Um, I think especially in terms of new membership, stopping some of the sort of like insular, uh, you know, kind of cliquish behavior that, that makes it so that people don't want to join because it feels like they're, they're not welcome. Um, beyond that, I mean, like I said, I, I actually, you know, knowing Andy, I'd, I'd love to hear why he specifically feels like they're not as valued as they used to be. Um, I do wonder if some of that, and I, I'm obviously not trying to speak for Andy here, comes from access issues or a focus on exploration. Um, but, you know, for sure, I think we need to make as big a tent as possible. And, and I'd love to hear more so that we can, we can, you know, try to figure out how to fix that part of the culture. You're muted, Hazel. Oh man, I sh I was just I slagging off it. slagging off Pete there. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Same question to you. How will the NSS help recreational cavers feel welcome and valued? You know, I, I would also um, like to give Randy more where that question is coming from uh, because, and I, I am a project caver, and I got my feet wet project caver and I guess I haven't done very many recreation trips I can count on my hand the amount of rec recreational trips that I've done but I don't uh, I don't know where recreation recreational cavers aren't feeling valued um, within our grotto locally I can speak to when we get new members um, we do our best to have new trips for all levels uh, we, we want to groom project cavers uh, and we will set up trips for them to help them start surveying, but Hazel, hey, so you're okay over there. But um, what? What? No, I'm making that face because somebody just gave Derek a point. No, but uh, anyways, uh, outside of that, we we do take our new gardens and recreation caves, and we recognize that you know some people do just want to see the underground, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as um, you know all the same conservation values are being taken into place there's a room for every type of caver within the NSS. Thanks, Nick. Same, <laughs> quest same question to John. How do you think the NSS can help recreational cavers feel welcomed and valued? 
Well, I think that's been an issue with grottos and caving as long as I've been caving. Uh, and, and I think the way you make them feel welcome is just to include them in trips, to set up, set up grotto trips, set up recreational trips, uh, talk to them when they come to the meetings, uh, or reach out to them. And I think what the NSS could do is, uh, is to acquire more cave preserves, create more opportunities for cavers to get into caves. Um, big challenge we have in Texas is most of the caves are on private land. And so new cavers sometimes don't have any place to go caving. It's not like it is back east. So that's always the challenge is finding opportunities to get new cavers into caves that are appropriate to their skill level. Thank and you. the NSS can help that by uh, helping organizations acquire more cave, cave access and cave preserves. Thank you. Mark, same question to you. Yeah, I think I'd add to the uh, problems in Texas that the caves seem to be filled up with CO2 all the time. Um, That's true. <laughs> uh, so what you got to do is you got to put on a good show, right? So at the Butler Cave Conservation Society, we don't do grotto meetings. We have project weekends, and we just invite scads of people, and we'll get 40 or 50 people. Uh, we're doing 10 of those now a year, or were. And then we have all level of caving and, and it's got to be fun. You know, we have a party on Friday or Saturday night. We go caving. Uh, some people do the hard caves and, and severe project caving and camping and other people just do sport trips. I love to lead sport trips for people who have never been underground before. I like to see their eyes light up. I think you got to make it fun. And that's not necessarily an NSS level job. That's a local grotto kind of thing. Um, to get people into caving. You've got to make their eyes light up and uh, get them excited. And then once the hook is set, uh, you know, you can continue on from there. But that's what we're doing anyway. In my neck of the woods, we do a lot of it. Thanks, Mark. Derek, do you want to do the follow-up? Uh, are we doing follow-up or next question? Next question, right? Um, there is a follow-up from Scott on the, um, uh, the chat. Did you see that? Um, see that. I don't know if this is much a question as a statement. Did you want to follow up with something else? Uh, yeah, I'd like to move on to the next question, if that's all right. Okay, that's fine. Um, so there's a question from Renee Ohms. This is from Facebook. Do you think it's viable for the NSS to continue to be run primarily by volunteers? Uh, we can start with Kim. Let me unmute you. Should be good to go, Kim. Okay. Um, so I just uh, read that there's a, an executive um, director um, exploration committee that's being headed up by Doug Warner, which I think is a good idea, which would take some of the stress if we had an executive director, it would take some of the stress off all the volunteers. Um, however, once again, that's gonna take money. That doesn't come for free. You, know, you have to pay somebody to do that job. Um, it is very difficult to run an all, all volunteer organization. Um, so we've been doing it for so long and I think we can continue to do it, but we need to get more people on board with volunteering specifically for committees, not just running for the bog. Okay, thanks, Kim. Uh, Riley. Do you think the NSS can continue to run primarily by volunteers? Um, I would agree with Kim in that it depends. Um, I think it depends on how good uh, the NSS can be at publicizing the opportunities to get involved with the NSS, um, which there are many, um, and including committees. Um, and depending on how many engaged and excited volunteers we can get, um, that'll sort of, I think, I think swing the balance as to whether it makes sense to keep having volunteers. Whether, um, whether we have the cycle of a few volunteers work really hard and burn out, um, and then that repeats. Um, but I think it depends on, on maybe the next year or two and, and how many new volunteers we can recruit using the renewed website um, and social media strategies. Okay, thanks, Riley. Uh, ben Tobin. Uh, thanks. I think to follow up on that, yeah, I agree. It's a 
definitely a big if. It's, it can work. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see what this executive director search um, comes up with or the committee comes up with as far as, you know, what the value of that will be to the organization. Um, but as far as keeping the, if we were to keep the organization as a volunteer run organization, it's possible. There are other organizations at our scale or larger that do similar things. I mean, the American Alpine Club is a great example. Um, the big thing we need is messaging. We need to let people know what the value of volunteering for the NSS is to them and to their beliefs and provide an easy access to, to do that. And I think um, this, the upgrade to the website may lead us to, in that direction as well. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, Sonia. So I think we definitely can keep running um, with volunteers, like Riley said, if we can improve our communication about volunteer opportunities through our new website, hopefully. Um, but the question is, should we? So my career is based in membership-based medical associations um, of similar size and larger than the NSS. And I see the different way that it's run when you have paid staff versus being run by volunteers. And I think the volunteers are amazing and hardworking, but burnout is a very real issue. So I think um, I was actually uh, proxying on the board and I voted to support the creation of this committee to explore the idea and part of the creation is finding funding. Um, and I think an important part of being a BOG member is to make financially responsible decisions so I would say if we're able to find funding for this, it would be a really good idea. Um, but I definitely want to relieve the burden from volunteer burnout and communicate about opportunities to volunteer with the NSS more. Thank you, Sonia. Back okay, to back to me. Okay, so I have a question for an anonymous. There are uh, two approaches to cave conservation. One is to uh, educate and get people excited about caves and caving by showing them the underground world with things like um, uh, online videos or talking about it with podcasts. The other is to protect caves through secrecy. And these are very disparate ideas that are being used and they can be, cause quite a lot of controversy. What are your views on the value of cave secrecy as a conservation tool? And I'm going to go with, oh, hard to start off this one off, but Riley, you're up. Um, I think, uh, as I said in my last answer, I think it depends a lot on the, the individual uh, caves. Um, I think that cave secrecy as a policy um, can really lock a lot of people out of the sport of caving. Um, but I think it is it is important to have caves that are at risk at, uh, with white nose syndrome here in the, the Northeast. Um, sometimes it does make sense to have those caves location secret, um, but that doesn't mean we should stop showing people caves um, that can be safely and uh, repeatedly shown. Thank you. Same question to Mark. Well, um... I'm, I'm part of the, the Virginia Speleological Survey, so we gather a lot of data, and we get a lot of requests for data, and we have to really closely vet that. So, yeah, you're, you're always playing a game between secrecy and open, openness and transparency. I would like to err on the side of openness and transparency. Um, so I don't hoard my leads. Uh, I usually like to have people come with me and... Um, as far as caves go, um, it's, it's not a very easy answer. It's, it's got to be a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. And the last one is... Pete. I, th I think generally we've gone way overboard on secrecy. I think that it's created a little bit of a culture that excludes new people. Um, I think this, I, I mean, to go back to what Andy's talking about in the recreational caving issue, you know, if you walk into a grotto and you're a new person and somebody says, we're not gonna take you to caves, that's a real easy way to turn a new person off. Um, I think 
you know, if those caves really do need protecting, the best way to protect them is not for one person to just throw that information in a filing cabinet somewhere and, and let it collect dust. I think that there are better ways to protect cave resources. Um, I know that, you know, Hans Bodenheimer did some work to determine that usually access is the most dependable, um, like most strongly correlated indicator that a cave is going to be adversely impacted. Um, and I think monitoring programs and other things like that can prevent uh, impact without us turning off a whole wave of new cavers or recreational cavers. That final wasn't that your third? No, that was my fourth. I got Riley, Mark, and Pete. Who else did you? Um, uh, Nick. Did Nick? Did you? I've got Nick knocked off. Yeah, Nick. Um, keep up, Derek. I think they've lost five points from that. Yeah, that's that's fair. Okay. Um, so next question. Um, I'm going to go with one from Buford Pruitt, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but it's uh, it's essentially. Uh, what do you think the NSS's role should be in cave ownership, um, either owning caves or um, facilitating the ownership of caves by um, conservancies? Uh, so give us your thoughts on uh, the NSS's role in cave ownership. And uh, start with uh, Kim. Okay. Um, I really, the ship has sailed, but I really don't think that the NSS should try to keep owning more and more caves. I'm definitely on the side of, the, of supporting the conservancies, the cave conservancies for ownership. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think slow to respond, Sonia. Um, I, don't have a very strong opinion on this and there are several things in the caving community that I don't have opinions for but what I do strongly believe is that BOG members as representatives of cavers need to be in constant communication with the members so for issues like this and all issues what I really want is to hear from the members about what they want um, I really want us to be representatives of caver issues and what the members want um, but to answer the question, uh, generally, I think it would be probably better for local cavers and conservancies to manage the caves and perhaps the NSS could act as an umbrella um, like the grottos are. Okay, thank you, Sonia. Uh, ben, your thoughts on the NSS's role in cave ownership? Yeah, I, ha I have lots of thoughts on this one. Um, so I think... Um, as Sonia just said, it does make a lot of sense for local groups to really manage these, manage cave preserves. Um, we as an organization do have guidelines on what it takes for a cave to kind of meet something that we need to manage as a cave. And I think that's critical. And I think um, one thing that we should all be looking at with any of these questions is, you know, how does this fit in with our vision and our mission as an organization? One thing I see a value for these properties is we're supposed to be the organization that is pushing forward, improving cave management. These provide a great opportunity for us to test our management practices to make sure what we're doing is actually doing what we says it, say it does. So I think a combination of the two is really kind of the perfect world um, and a place for us to be a leader in pushing cave management forward. Thanks, Ben. Uh, John Brooks, your thoughts on NSS and cave ownership? Well, I, th I think that regional conservancies can do a better job than the NSS, but, um, but I also think that there's probably some instances where NSS participation in the acquisition of a cave makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the challenges that we find in Texas and this part of the country is that a lot of times caves are on larger pieces of land that uh, as uh, conservancies that are run by local volunteers, we, we can't afford to uh, purchase those properties. And so I, I've always wished that a national organization would, would help us uh, help us with acquisition strategies of larger assets so that we can uh, bring 
caves in this area under control. So I think the NSS does have a role to play, but I don't think it's fully defined. Thank you, John. Back over to you, Hazel. Uh, just a point of clarification, Nick, did you get skipped? I did, so I'd be happy to jump in on this question. I, would, I was <laughs> keeping score. <laughs> Nick, would you like to answer this question? Sure, uh, and only just because it's fortuitous that um, here uh, there is the 20th NSS cave preserve. Um, the Black Hills Cave Nature Conservancy just created an MOU with the NSS uh, for the 20th cave uh, preserve housing, I think eight caves and uh, the NSS should definitely own caves. It promotes our mission. Uh, the NSS can protect these caves. It can also bring cavers into them uh, in a way that uh, protects the caves, recreational cavers can go visit these caves, uh, but they can also protect the caves that we probably shouldn't be showing to everybody. Uh, uh, and to kind of piggyback off what other people were saying, um, that uh, if a regional organization wants to buy caves, they shouldn't be competing with the NSS. The NSS should be doing everything in their power to help these regional preserves to acquire the cave and offer their resources and expertise to manage these lands. Um, there, there should be no competition there. Uh, and I'm gonna put a plug in for our conservancy. If you want to help us uh, find the money for our new conservancy, go visit uh, Black Hills Cave. Um, that's my, my plug there. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Okay, so I have the next question. This question comes from Gary Shout. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, this question is, <clears throat> and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. How do you make the public associate the NSS with responsible scientific research? And rather than just saying we need to do that, can you give some examples of how you could do that? And this question first goes to Kim. Well, the um, Journal of Cave and Car Studies, I think that's what it's called, right? Um, is the scientific journal that is well known. So, and it's published by the NSS um, three times a year. So I'm not sure how much more That's, that's fine. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. Nick, you're up again. Hang on, Nick. Oh, you keep re... Okay. okay. <laughs> Hazel, uh, you're cutting out there. Can you repeat that question, please? Yes, of course. How do you make the public associate the NSS with responsible scientific research with an actual explicit example? Mm. I, I hate to do this here uh, because I'm going to play favoritism to one of the moderators, but uh, in recent times... Uh, this better not be Derek because I will shut <laughs> you down. Uh, I guess, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell both here. Uh, with the NSS webinars that they've been starting to promote more recently, um, Hazel obviously was featured for her COVID response and her questions to that. Um, and the NSS has been picking cavers I think to kind of help promote our scientific mission and advertising those um, Hazel's reputable science uh, she claims, but um, the NSS is just promoting her work. And on the flip side of that, uh, Derek Russell is a relatively known caver out west, and uh, he creates fantastic videos about cave conservation. And the NSS is uh, came through with a series on his uh, Into the Caving, and I think it's getting. Uh, cavers who are involved and people who know they are and promoting the work that cavers are doing who have a name in science or conservation. Thanks, Nick. I'll give you. Yes, thank you. I'm not going to say anything because this is not about me. Ben. I, I hate to do this, Hazel, but I'm going I'm to give Derek some points here. Sorry. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think there's a number of things that um, the NSS can do to really kind of make the public associate the NSS with cave conservation and pushing that limit forward. Um, one that I mentioned is 
using our properties as research and education tools more broadly and expanding that horizon outside of the caving world. Um, one way to do that, YouTube um, or other social media outlets. Um, my son found Derek on YouTube. Apparently that's what middle schoolers do is search YouTube and they find things like Derek's videos. Um, and just kind of a brief look at that, he was telling me, or I looked it up today, Derek has over 3,000 followers compared to the NSS having about 600. So having the quality content really helps. And so we can get that out there. Um, other things are stronger ties with the land management agencies. There's a number of cave NSS members that are cave managers working with them more closely, building our um, MOUs with those organizations, um, revisiting some of them that haven't been revisited in a long time is a way to kind of make others that care about caves know that we are um, an important organization to be involved in all of these discussions. Thanks, Ben. So the question to Riley, how do you make the public associate the NSS with responsible scientific research with some specific examples? Um, I agree with what uh, Ben was saying in terms of using our properties as research and education tools. Um, I also think it's important to, to reach out to a broad, uh, broad group, um, not necessarily just people who uh, show up at grottos, but also to work, uh, work to reach out to local schools, local parks and recreation departments, churches, Boy Scouts. Um, uh, also, the NSS has some grants and scholarships, so well public, making sure those are well publicized, um, I think, helps promote the NSS as a leadership organization. Um, promoting the work of individual scientists, um, like Hazel, I think is important. Um, and also the NSS uh, has uh, the ability to print things. So the NSS press could maybe, uh, in addition to the uh, Cave and Karst Journal, could have some other smaller publications throughout the year. Thank you, Riley. Derek. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna move on to another question. This is from Renee Ohms. Uh, what creative solutions do you have for incentivizing participation in NSS business, which requires significant time, travel, and expense? for those who may not have the resources. So I, I would interpret that as doing things like serving on the Board of Governors or committees. Um, so what are some ideas for things uh, to incentivize that? Uh, we'll start with John Brooks. Let me unmute you. Uh, well, I'm a little thrown off by the term incentivize. I think that the board really needs to look at technological solutions to reduce the amount of travel. Maybe have Zoom meetings on a monthly basis instead of always traveling to different locations to do that. But I think if somebody's willing to serve on the board and participate, I think they're aware that there's going to be some challenges and some travel involved. And that, that comes with participating in the organization. But I think that there are ways to uh, lessen the burden through technology and that's uh, structuring conference calls, planning out schedules so people can plan around, uh, plan their calendars around when they're going to have meetings. Uh, the TCMA has recently gone to, well, we're doing more conference calls instead of in-person meetings. And that works just as well as the in-person meetings uh, when you have the relationships established. So you have to come together occasionally to develop the relationships you need to do business. But I think you can supplement it with technology. Thanks, John. Uh, Mark Hodge, what can be done to, let's say, encourage uh, people? Uh, yeah, I, I got it. I, I don't really think you need to do anything more than what, what, they're, what we're doing already. I mean, you've got nine people running for five positions uh, with significant travel involved. I do like doing uh, more often meetings of less duration via conference call. That's what we do in the BCCS. We have six board meetings a year where we used to have two. And the two used to be four or five hours each, and they were awful. And now we have six, and they're like two hours apiece. So that's much better. And um, the other thing I wanted to say, I wanted to apologize. I have to skip out a little bit early today, so this is going to be it for me. Okay, Mark. Thank, thank you. Take care, talk. guys. Yeah, take care. Uh, Pete, what can be done to encourage participation for those with lesser means? 
Yeah, I mean, so I, um, I'm actually on the executive director of the committee that was mentioned earlier. And I, I think that there is potential for operational overhaul of the NSS. But at the end of the day, it is a volunteer organization at heart. Um, I, I think just allowing people to feel like they are effective and change matters. Um, you know, we're currently overhauling the website. There's three of the people on this Zoom call right now that are on the website committee. And we have 12 people, so, as someone else may have an exact count, I think it's 12, leaning into overhauling the website. And there's full volunteer engagement and there is rapid forward progress. And I think some of that is just knowing that they can affect the things that they think matter in the organization. Um, I think we've burned a lot of volunteers out by not showing support for them. Um, I think we've done a poor job of letting people think that they can make a difference. And I think just those little things and starting at the bottom, even Cindy, you know, I saw that you were encouraging people to vote, which is like a great way, to, you know, to, to, it's just a slippery slope, like just come get involved in the organization. And if you show that people can make change, and if you show that they can have a role, they're going to do it. I mean, look at Montana, look at cave camp, look at all these parts of the country that have had great grassroots level engagement. Um, just because people were engaged in the society. Thanks, Pete. Sonia, what, what are your thoughts? Um, so I think there's several things we can do to lessen the barrier to entry to volunteering for the NSS. So one is having remote meetings be a possibility. Um, it's a huge financial uh, constraint and that was one of the reasons I almost didn't run and then I got a full-time job so I knew I could afford the travel um, but yeah having remote meetings be a possibility is really important I think lessening the time commitment by utilizing technology to be more effective team members so I proxied for the bog last year and there were so many emails and that's basically what you hear from anyone that's been on the bog so using better communication channels using things like Google Docs so you're not emailing the same PDF with one change like 50 times um, just like very simple things like that can really cut down on the time commitment and reduce volunteer burnout and then lastly is communication the NSS is already doing so many things and they're doing things right, but we just need to communicate what we are doing. We need to communicate those volunteer opportunities and communicate the things that we do to attract people to be interested in the NSS. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, back over to you, number two. You have to unmute yourself. Do you want me to unmute you? So Oh, no, I've got a little space bar thing I'm supposed to press and make that happen. It's all gone wonky. All right. <clears throat> there are, thank you, number two. There are um, a number of questions related to um, limitations on funding for the NSS. So this question comes from John Jasper, and I'm going to um, uh, uh, probably... Uh, say it in a slightly different way, but hopefully uh, maintain the question. Um, where should the NSS um, invest and where should it disinvest? And this first question goes to John. Well, I, I think that the NSS should have a, a sound portfolio of conservative and less conservative investments. Uh, I know that the headquarters has been a controversial subject. And uh, even though I'm an architect and deal with capital facilities as a profession, I'm not really in favor of uh, nonprofit organizations or organizations like the NSS having capital facilities because there's, it requires a large outlay of capital investment over years to maintain them. But now that the NSS does own it, I think that they need to take some, make some strategic decisions on how to maintain it and what they're gonna do with it in the future. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's been some planning done, but I think that they really need to look at that. Um, I also think that, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> where should be the NSS be investing its money and where should it be disinvesting? Well, I would say disinvesting. I would say they need to think very carefully about uh, real estate and uh, buildings in that sort of facilities. And in my opinion is that they should be investing their money in land and uh, buying caves, but then also in 
um, securities markets and bonds and mutual funds and those sorts of things. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, I think that's about where the, the organization spends its budget rather than the um, National Geological Foundation, so not um, investment investments, um, where it invests its, uh, its income as far as uh, should we spend money on buying caves? Should we spend money on increasing membership? Should we disinvest in um, the headquarters? Something more specific to actually how the budget gets spent on the goals and priorities of the organization. Well, I think all of those are priorities. I think you. I don't think you can spend all your money on caves. You've got to. You've got to have a sound. You have to have a sound uh, basis and a, 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 a bucket of money that you're that you're pulling out of to buy caves. But I think if you invest your money properly, your assets are going to grow and you're going to be able to invest in caves. But I think caves are the priority. I don't think buildings are. Okay, thank you. Same question to Sonia. And I, my apologies for, for not making that clearer. So this is a really great question. And my main issue is fine. So one of the things I would like to see, hopefully by the end of my term on the board, is I want the board leadership and even membership to come together in a collaborative way to reassess the mission of the NSS and then examine every committee that we have and make sure that those committees are in line with our mission and we should only be giving dollars to um, our activities that are directly related to our mission and the NSS does a lot of amazing work across a breadth of um, fields, which is great, but I really think it's important to have a more narrow focus so that what we do, we do it really well instead of dispersing our investments, our money across too many different, you know, pots, so to say. Thank you. Same question to Ben. Yes, I think um, first and foremost, we really should be investing uh, our income into communication, into our presence to draw in more members, to keep more members here. Um, I think that will lead to a strengthened organization overall. Beyond that, I think Sonia brought up some very good points, right? We have a wide variety of uh, committees and organizations within the NSS and a bunch of different things that we're doing and I think it's really important for the BOG and the membership to have a very clear and transparent way of choosing by the advantages of those groups, right? So we can actually come up with a ranking of how well these individual things are fitting and fulfilling our mission as an organization. And from that, decide which ones are the most critical to spend our money on. And as we if we get a reduced budget, then we start thinking about which ones we have to not fund as opposed to keeping all of them. Or if we get an um, increased budget, we expand the budget on some of the lower priorities. Thanks, Ben. Same question to Kim. I thought Sonia's answer was really interesting um, about Taking a, taking a really hard look at the committees and how to uh, financially support those. Um, we do need to make sure that we take care of the building that we already own and to continue to pay it, pay it ourselves back for that through, the, um, through our loan with the NSF. Um, and when that's done, we can, can, we can do more things with it. We can use the facility there for what we got it for. Um, there's a boatload of stuff that's stored down there. Um, and unless it goes back to where it was, which was in people's basements and attics and such, um, we're just going to have to maintain the building in order to maintain the, the historical um, items that are stored there. So that's. Thanks, Kim. Derek. Uh, okay, I'll go into the next question. This is from Jenny McKee. Uh, how do we make the younger generation not feel so shut out of their local grottos and access to caving information? And I'll start with Pete. Yeah, so I, th I think um, 
I'd kind of like to, to get grotto leaders that have been successful in getting new people in the door. And I've already spoken with a few of them um, to, to sort of compose a roadmap of what they've done to see success with their grottos uh, for two reasons. One, I think for grottos that do want to change and want to engage new younger people, it'll provide us like a solution proactive based thing for them to, to pursue. Um, but I also think it changes the debate from membership is inevitably de going to decline, which I don't think is true to, you know, why, why is membership declining? Let's find a way to fix it. Um, beyond that, because at the end of the day, you know, grottos are going to, going to do what they want to do. I think that we should increase engagement with younger people on the national level. So I think if they come to the website again, they should, and they submit their information, um, we should put them on a listserv with other young cavers around the country. We should reach back out to them so that if they fall through the cracks of the local grotto system, um, we are still engaging with them as a national organization. I don't think we're maximizing our ability to reach out uh, as a national organization. And all that happens through social media, it happens through email, it happens through all the ways that people are communicating in 2020. Okay, yeah, thanks, Pete. Uh, Riley, give me a second. Uh, see, I click on unmute and nothing happens. There we go. Yeah, I'm not, maybe I, maybe it's just giving me a button to click on. You gotta, you gotta actually, you gotta click the image. You gotta click the actual thing that says Mute, as opposed to just randomly touching the screen. All right, okay. Riley. Cool. Um, so I think that we should uh, reach out to college clubs um, actively. Um, I have uh, facilitated a relationship between the Boston Grotto and the MIT Caving Club. Um, and I think that uh, nationwide, it makes sense to reach out to college clubs um, and give them information about how to safely and sustainably cave and also to connect them with their local grotto. Um, it might not be a connection that they take up uh, immediately, um, but to have that connection in place and to allow um, maybe uh, in the case of uh, the Boston Grotto and the MIT Caving Club, we've had events, vertical practices together, eventually um, caving trips together. Um, so I think that we really need to take advantage of the fact that there are cavers at the college and university level and they're not making it to the NSS. And I think that bridging that gap is gonna be really important to recruiting new cavers. Okay, thank you, Riley. Uh, Nick. Uh, I'm going to start by kind of picking up of what uh, Peter said. You, you guys have heard a lot about uh, the new website, um, and I am part of that effort along with Peter and Sonia here. But uh, to echo a cable that I know, the NSS is doing big things, and we need to let people know that we are doing big things. And that's the first step to outreach of people being able to find us. And I truly think that a new public base, which starts with the website, is a way to address that. But uh, locally, and I could be wrong here, but I think only 25% of Grotto members are actually NSS members. So this does start at the local level. We need to um, we need to be supporting Grottoers to make them better advocates for us. Like we, we need to be educating Grotto leadership of why their members should be joining the NSS. And it starts with the leaders. Our local Grotto, and I'll continue using our local Grotto as an example, has a mentorship program. Uh, experienced cavers take on new cavers and teach them the ropes, encourage them to join the NSS, and get them involved more and more in the caving community. Um, and that's kind of a grassroots effort there that we need to start. Thanks, Nick. Okay, so um, I yeah. just, yes, you wanna add something? You have something next? I, I was gonna interject. You're okay. Um, I, there was a question earlier, and I thought maybe this would be a good time for a little bit of a change up, but uh, Gary Schindel was at, wanted to ask, uh, this would be a question for all the candidates, um, sort of a short one, but um, this would be, uh, could you describe um, a leadership role you've had with the NSS on a national level? Uh, so any committees you've served on, uh, volunteering for convention or anything of that nature. So um, you're it, you, again, your involvement with the national organization, not with local grottos. Um, maybe we could go around and just um, start with Sonia. So um, my involvement at the national level started pretty recently. Um, first, I proxied at the uh, fall bog meeting last year for Cindy, and that was my first introduction to the national level stuff. Um, and since then, I have signed on as co-chair 
for programs for the NSS 2021 convention in Weeds. So make sure you guys come, it's gonna be really good. Um, and I'm also serving on the uh, caves.org committee to revamp the website and uh, have been doing some data analysis about our website metrics. So I'm really excited for that because like Pete mentioned, I think the website is um, gonna be very, very important for a variety of reasons, but most importantly, attracting more members, which will hopefully address our finance and diversity issue. Thanks, Sonia. Pete? Um, so yeah, I'm also on the, as mentioned, I'm on the website committee along with Nick and Sonia. Um, I'm on the executive director committee to determine whether that's a viable path forward for the NSS. Um, in addition to that, I've led national, both expeditions and projects. Um, I led the 2019 Tears of the Turtle trip. I know that that's not directly involved with the NSS, but it was under an NSS grant. Um, and I've led survey projects in Wyoming involving people from all over the country. Uh, I think that's about it. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Nick? Uh, at the national level, um, I've served as a proxy for Adam Weaver for uh, several Zoom um, NSS meetings, and I was supposed to attend uh, a meeting for him as well. Uh, I'm the logistics chair for the uh, 2022 convention here in Custer, South Dakota. Uh, I am on the case at org committee, as I've mentioned, and I'm also on the internal, the IO committee of the NSS, uh, dealing with updating uh, our grotto's information. Great, thanks, Nick. Ben? And so I served as a proxy for Steve Bladu at um, last year's um, NSS convention bog meeting. Um, Kind of since Pete brought up some of the other related things, I've also been involved in NSS supported and leading NSS supported um, surveys and projects, so international grants in particular. Um, and that's kind of it at the national level. I've been heavily involved at kind of state level. And then my experience with the uh, National Park Service was involved a lot in cave management discussions um, across the country within that, uh, within the Park Service. Okay, thanks, Ben. John? Well, I haven't uh, been involved in very many. I haven't been involved in the NSS at a national level. I've been involved in local caving and uh, state caving and regional efforts, but uh, I haven't really done anything with the NSS. Thanks, John. Uh, Kim? Uh, hang on. Okay, there you go. So I was on the BOG. I served from 2016 to 2018. Um, it was a two-year term because I backfilled somebody who either became an officer or stepped down. I can't remember the reason. Um, I am currently the vice chair for the 2020, now the 2023 convention. I was the treasurer for the NSS convention in 2013, which <coughs> was in uh, Shippensburg. Pennsylvania. Um, I served 11 years as the T-shirt and symbolic emblems salon chair uh, from 20, 2002 to 2012 when I passed it off to Dave Decker um, as I became the treasurer for the convention in 2013. And I became a member of the fundraising committee in 2016 and I suppose I'm still on it, although we're pretty um, quiet right now. We don't have a chair. So that's it. Thanks, Kim. Riley? Um, so my involvement has largely been at the local and regional level. Um, since Pete mentioned, I also uh, went and uh, did, I think, partially NSS supported uh, cave science in South Dakota. Um, as part of a collaboration between my lab at MIT and uh, Dr. Barton's lab. Um, and we were looking at the microbial communities in Wind and Jewel Cave. So it was cool to have a lot of people from uh, different locations all over the country doing that project. Thanks, Riley. Uh, now back to you, number two. 
Thank you, number two. Um, and I had to take off a thousand points because you you broke with the plan. Um, and, and I do have a um, a question here from somebody that's texted me, and I think actually this one's for you, Derek. Um, and they want to know if the NSS is able to produce educational videos for its members as good as the ones that Hazel makes for Derek. So um, I that that's- question too. That was that was a great question. Thank you, Bonnie. That's fake, that's fake news. That's from Bonnie. Um, so thank you for everybody for for um, holding on there. Thanks to the candidate. I know it's ty candidates. I know it's tiring to to talk like this. It feels like a job interview. Um, and I wanted to say at one point we were up to 117 people and we're still above 100. So I want to thank everyone for sticking around. We're going to wrap this up right now. Um, every candidate is going to have a two minute closing statement. Uh, and then uh, I guess we'll we'll wrap it up. We'll tally the scores to see how much I beat Derek by, um, and and we'll, this thing will come to an end. So I have made a big pile here, and so I'm going to pick names at random from the hat uh, for people to make their concluding two minute statement. And we are going to start with Nick. This doesn't seem very random at all, Hazel. I'm the first name I do half, half the time. Special. I think, Anyways, they, I, I, think I might have folded your bit of paper a bit wonky. It keeps standing up funny. I think that's why it's, it's attracting my attention. Anyways, uh, as I've, um, you know, as we've seen the Facebook post about the debate and the election, and we've seen, in my opinion, more interest in this year's election, we still don't have a lot of uh, members that have voted. Uh, last count I saw, we're at 8.2%. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions. Um, a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about the NSS. And the best way to get that your voice is heard is to vote in this election. If we only have 10% of the population vote, how can we adequately represent our entire um, NSS membership? Um, and that's kind of a cornerstone of my platform is communication. I want to be available to the membership. I want to be able to address your guys' concerns. Um, I know there's been a lot of comments about uh, in the past, like these are the same issues, you know, declining membership, how do we engage in people, the secrecy of caves that have been around since the 80s. And I, you know, I haven't been licensed in the 80s, but I don't know if these issues are really prevalent or if it's just a, a common statement. But I think that we just haven't come to the right solutions yet. And I think uh, with some of the candidates on here, a mix of some of the people on the board, we can finally start addressing these issues adequately and moving forward so that future candidates don't have to be addressing the same issues of declining membership of public image. I think uh, change starts now uh, with some of the projects and uh, I'm gonna plug for myself. That's why I, I hope you vote for me with the energy that I wanna to bring to the blog. I wanna address all these concerns. I wanna fix our website. I wanna fix our public image. Um, I want to move the NSS forward to be a national and world leader in cave science and exploration. Thank you, Nick. Sonia. Um, so a lot of things have been said. Um, I guess I want to reemphasize that I have um, a lot of experience with project management and organizational skills. And I think that's one of the most important issues for the internal functioning of the NSS is to get things running smoothly in an efficient manner, um, as I've said before, and utilizing technology in a way that can reduce the volunteer commitment and burnout. Um, utilizing the website to uh, communicate the amazing things that the NSS does do. Um, I think that the top-down analysis of our mission statement and our committees is really important um, and kind of narrowing the function of the NSS and then really communicating um, what we do well. Um, and the last thing is that communication is so important. Um, I've only been in the caving community for five years, so I really want to hear from members. I really want to hear what you think. Um, I will listen to everyone that contacts me, and I've already had many illuminating phone calls um, since the election started, and I've learned a ton. Uh, so I really want to be a representative of the people and I want you guys to tell me what you want and I want to communicate what the issues that we're facing on the bog are so that there's more transparency both with the issues as well as financially. 
Thank you. Riley. Um, I agree with what you said. Um, uh, I personally have a, a track record of uh, fostering communication between different uh, caving groups with MIT Caving Club and the Boston Grotto. Um, I have a little bit of experience in cave science. Um, and as a researcher, I have a fair amount of uh, experience managing my own grants um, and making sure that they don't get overspent. Um, in terms of uh, facing the problems that the NSS is looking at today, um, I think that we need more members, um, but we need more engaged members. So we don't need to just have many members on a spreadsheet, um, but to have many people who know what the mission of the NSS is and uh, believe that the NSS is actively working towards that. Um, and I think that that starts with communication, but it ends with having more members who are engaged in the national organization. Um, so uh, yeah, I would love to hear all, uh, what everyone thinks um, and what they see as problems or solutions um, on, on the national level. Um, and I've already had some great conversations um, with some results that I didn't really know. So um, thank you. Thank you, Riley. Pete. I think um, I think Nick kind of nailed the, the the hit it on the head earlier when he said that we're doing big things. I mean, I think sometimes we lose perspective on the NSS. Uh, it's currently an amazing organization, um, and and a lot of that comes from people that are doing a lot of really hard volunteer work. But I think if we want to grow, we the message is there. It's and it's compelling. We just need to get it out there, and we need to do things like overhaul the website. We need to double down on social media. We need to support Crados. Um, we need to provide tech solutions to grottos uh, and, and you know all that is like in progress and it's sort of foolish to think that one person can come in and get anything done um, like I said there's a you know the officers are hard at work doing all this stuff that we all know are issues uh, but professionally I've managed million dollar budgets and I can tell you need to manage million dollar budgets I can read profit and loss statements I understand accounting and finance um, you know I've I've helped lead projects nationally. Uh, if there's any way I can help, I'd, I'd love to. Um, you know, and obviously that comes down to a vote, but no matter what happens, I think the organization is, is really pretty unique and it's easy to get lost in the divisiveness of stuff like the headquarters or cave access. But at the end of the day, I think for the most part, we're all on the same page and, and I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of the NSS and it, it's really changed my life, so. I think that's what I'd end on. Thanks, Pete. Kim. I am so excited that there's all these young cavers willing to run for the bog. Um, it's just, it's really, um, it just makes me so happy that um, it's not just a bunch of us old people having to continue it on. Um, so, I hope that anybody who uh, does not get elected during this um, period will volunteer or pick up a, a, a committee if you haven't already. Um, the role of the BOG is, is really interesting. It's really to guide the NSS, not to micromanage all the committees and the, and the officers. And we have to remember that um, when we're doing our work, should we, get elected to do that. Um, and um, anyway, good luck to all of us. And I look forward to working with anybody in the future, no matter how it well works, it shakes out. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. John. Yes. Uh, well, I'm running for the bog because I believe in caves and caving and making the caving world a little bit better for all of us. And my primary focus is I want to see cavers owning more caves in the future. Um, so I, I know I haven't been involved in the NSS uh, in the past, but I've been a member since the late 70s, and I've been a president of the state caving organization. I've been president of a caving conservancy. I've been a grotto president and grotto vice chair. I've served all the roles at a regional level of leadership. Uh, and I've done a good job of getting people involved in caving. Uh, professionally, I'm sought after for board positions. I've been on boards of several nature conservancies in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
and uh, continue to be asked to participate in those. And so I feel like I have the leadership skills and the wisdom to weigh the issues that are facing this organization and make informed decisions. And that's what I bring to the table is a perspective in a way of solving problems that are perhaps is perhaps unconventional uh, that has been overlooked. And so I really believe in the process of how you arrive at decisions and feel that I can contribute at a very high level to this organization. Thank you. Ben. Thanks. I think, um, first off, I want to thank, I guess it's Facebook for creating this event tonight um, with a little bit of push from Hazel and Derek. Um, this is amazing. Um, having over 100 people on this call shows how engaged people are and how much people care about the NSS. Um, and the NSS is doing great things. As we've talked about a lot tonight, uh, there is a lot of um, great things going on. The big thing is about messaging, getting the word out that this is happening. Uh, beyond that, it's being very clear and very deliberate and transparent about how we are moving forward as an organization and tying those, um, those paths forward to our mission, to why we exist as a group. Um, and I think um, my background as a, a cave manager, thinking about resource management, thinking about cave research, and just generally being um, a caver thinking about these questions um, is one of the reasons that I ran for this. It's an amazing opportunity to help an organization that is um, fantastic move forward. And I think any of the candidates that spoke tonight are great candidates and have a lot to give the organization. And I think um, one thing that I would um, challenge everybody who's on this call, so there's currently 97 of us, um, you probably know a caver who is not planning on voting. Get them to vote. I don't care who it's for, get them to vote. Um, get them engaged in our organization and let's keep moving forward. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so um, that concludes this event. Um, we've been uh, recording it, so we will find an avenue to get this posted online. So anyone who wasn't enabled, wasn't able to make it can see it. And if you were a, came and you know people that are undecided, you can share it with them. I wanna thank all the candidates for taking the time Obviously, it's a very difficult thing that we're asking people to do. And the, as many of the candidates said, uh, having so many people interested is, is a great thing and, and shows a lot about the society. It's, it's, I served on the board for six years and it is a lot of work, um, but it's also really fulfilling. So we can thank the, the candidates and also all the people that currently serve on the, the BOG and also the people in the administrative roles that keep the organization running. So um, I'm done, Derek, would you like to add anything? No, I, I maybe I would echo what uh, Ben said. If it, anybody that's uh, still on and listening, uh, I would strongly encourage everyone to vote and encourage everyone they know to vote as well. I agree that the 20% voting rate that we typically have is, is uh, way underrepresenting the membership. So, and yeah, I'd like to thank the candidates again for participating. And, uh, and the final tally, I think, is uh, Hazel 17 and Derek minus 100,000. I don't see where that is. So there's a clear winner tonight. see where that is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate what you've done and the taking the time. I know it was, it was probably pretty exhausting, but this is great. It's, uh, we're really lucky to have you all.